So when I was writing The Shining Girls, I, I came up with this idea of a time-traveling serial killer. And I knew immediately that I couldn't set it in South Africa because I was interested in the 20th century. I wasn't going to do caveman, Shakespeare, you know, King Arthur's Court. I wasn't going to do that. I, I was interested in the 20th century and how things have changed and how things have shaped us and the same mistakes that we make, um, like the McCarthyism, how that echoes um, the war on terror today, um, but also apartheid. Um, I wrote about Chicago because I've lived there and it has a lot of similarities to Johannesburg. Um, it felt like writing about home because it's it's the shining city full of promise and the, it was the birth of the skyscraper, um, but it was also the birth of, of uh, really bad segregation and it's one of the most racially segregated cities in America. Um, the apartheid government went to Chicago in the 1950s to learn how to do segregation better, which is that you drive a highway straight through the slums. So it's a segregated city, um, there's a lot of corruption, they've got former mayors in jail, um, and there's a very high crime rate. You know, when I, was, when I was there doing research, my friends told me that the previous summer there had been 40 shootings in one weekend. I was like, holy cow, Johannesburg's safer. So it felt like writing about home, and I, I needed to be able to write a story that wasn't under the shadow of apartheid. So the 20th century, you know, 19, 1920s to 1990s, if you said that in South Africa, it has to be an apartheid story, and apartheid will just take over the entire thing. So I wanted to talk about women's rights and, um, and how history has shaped us and the same mistakes that we make over and over again. Um, so I needed a broader canvas, and America made sense, and Chicago made sense for me. Um, so that's why I said in Chicago. But the story, you know, it's, it's about a time-traveling serial killer and the survivor who turns the hunt around. And she's going to find this guy and stop him no matter what. And one of the lines that she says is, how can you let the shit go? Um, and she's not going to let it go. You know, everyone keeps telling her to get over it and to get, you know, to move on with her life. And yes, this terrible thing happened to her, but she needs to move on. And that sentiment, which very much drives the book, comes from an, a personal experience that I had where a 23-year-old friend of mine um, was locked in her shack by, well, she, she was attacked by her boyfriend um, in, in the townships in, in Cape Town. He stabbed her and he poured boiling water over her head um, and then he locked the shack and walked away. And after five days, the police broke the door down um, because, you know, the neighbors had heard moaning coming from inside. And she was still alive, um, but she had very bad infections from the burns and from the wounds. And she was in agony, of course. Um, and they took her to hospital, and she was in and out of hospital for four months. You know, her mother would phone me at like 2 o'clock in the morning and say, I need some money to be able to take her to the, to the hospital. And I would send her the money. Um, and she died um, after four months. Um, the night after the boyfriend who did this to her was seen outside their house. And she was, she was so afraid, and she couldn't, she couldn't move out of the bed, and she saw him kind of looking through the window. Um, and she died the next morning. So I was helping the family try to get justice. Um, and we went to go and visit the woman's legal center, and we, um, you know, I tried to get the hospital records. And, but, I, but all the way through, I assumed that the police were doing their job. And we got to court. I went with the sister because the mom couldn't bear to go. Um, and he was there because in, in the South African courts, you don't, they're not, there's no separation between um, the accused and the victims. Everyone sits in the same waiting area outside. And the sister pointed him out to me and said, well, there he is. And he was sitting with his new 19-year-old girlfriend holding her hand. And I felt, I felt so angry and righteous. And I was like, you're going to jail. And it's going to be, I'm so glad you're going to jail for what you did. And then the prosecutor called us into his office and he said, I can't try this case. And he showed us the single piece of paper that was the entire police investigation. Um, they'd taken down, they'd interviewed her in hospital and they had her testimony. And, and it was one page, you know, it wasn't the whole thing at all. And that was it. They hadn't investigated the neighbors who called the police. They hadn't got the hospital records. Um, they hadn't interviewed people to find out that there was a history of abuse. And maybe he wouldn't have gone to jail for murder, but he would have, he would have gone down for assault. But the, the prosecutor said, I can't try this case. There's nothing here. If I take this into the court in front of the judge, it's going to be his word against hers, and she's dead. You know, so there's no ways to, to go to court. I'm going to throw this case out, get it reopened, come back to me. And I burst into tears. And I'm not, I'm not one who's prone to crying, but I just burst into tears in his office because it felt like my whole world had shattered 
because I fundamentally believed in the fairy tale of justice. I believed in Law and Order, I believed in Murder, She Wrote, I believed in Hill Street Blues, and all those TV shows where the bad guys go down, and, and the justice system works. So I, I was very angry and, and, and very frustrated, and um, I, I got the case reopened, you know, because, because I'm white and I'm middle class and I have a voice and I have journalist friends and I, you know, I know how to use my voice. I know what my rights are. I know, you know, I'm, this is a class difference. And you see this all over the world is that we live in different realities. If you're poor and or if you're middle class, you have a different experience of justice, of medicine, of childcare, of everything. And yes, we walk past each other in the streets, but we might as well be in different dimensions. So I got the case reopened. I got into all the major newspapers. Um, and a week later, the family phoned me, and this was now three months after she'd been buried. And they said, please, we can't go through with this. Y you have to let it go. Um, we, d we don't want to go through it again. We don't want to exhume her body. She's been buried up country in kind of the rural homelands. Um, we don't want to talk about it anymore. We just can't relive this again. Please let it go. And it was the hardest thing that I had to do was let it go. But it wasn't, it wasn't mine. Um, but it's, yeah, it was... It was so that's very much kind of what fueled the book is, and, and we shouldn't let this shit go. We can't, we can't stand for violence against women. And it's not just a pretty corpse. It's not just a bloody puzzle. When you see a woman reported dead in the news, this was a person. And never mind that she was someone's sister or mother or daughter or friend. She was a human being in her own right, and now she is gone. And, and that's what I wanted to address with this book, is to bring it back to, to the victims and to really talk about what violence is and what it does to us.